I was born to a Muslim family, to parents who were very serious about teaching and encouraging their kids to, my brothers and I, to embrace our Islam and take it very seriously. And I took that encouragement and I really ran with it. So much so that um, in my teens and around 18, I had already read the Quran through numerous times. I developed a pretty good understanding uh, at an early age of Islam and uh, my, what man, mankind's place uh, in the great scheme of things and who Allah was and that he was a master of all, all creation and that we were simply his servants and we were to submit to him. And I, um, I, I really understood that he was simply that. He was so other than, than me, than human beings, that there was no connection with us other than master and servant. While he knew, he knew me through and through, I really couldn't know him. And um, it didn't bother me for a while. That just was perfectly fine with me as I kind of embraced my Islam and learned Islamic doctrine and theology and history uh, in my studies. And I took my Islam very seriously. I took it seriously because I wanted to preach to people I knew, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims uh, who were nominal, or the uh, atheists that I knew about Islam. I really believed in my heart that it was the truth that God had revealed himself perfectly in this book through his very words in Arabic to mankind and that this was the most perfect book ever written because God had written himself through Muhammad and I wanted to give that to people who didn't believe it or who didn't know it. I found myself during that time engaging many people of different faiths as I said but the most staunch opposition came from Christians. They always gave me reasons for their belief and that annoyed me. Didn't want, didn't want people to give me good reasons for their beliefs. I began to study Christianity and read the Bible. I just wanted to see what it had, what it had to say so I had ammunition to use against Christians so I could uh, show them how true Islam was. And a verse popped up. I believe it's Luke 3, 9. Think not to say to yourself that you have Abraham as your father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up sons of Abraham from the stones. Now, what that meant to me was, it isn't important where you came from. What's important is if, is, is, is if what you believe your whole life is true or not. And John the Baptist was speaking to me 2,000 years later, telling me, you know what, you're so interested in t t telling Christians and others why they're wrong. You better make sure you're right. And maybe they are too. And so I got a little bit more of an open mind. I wasn't by, by far, I was not a Christian. I had no intention of becoming a Christian. So I decided to do a comparative study between Christianity and Islam. Really to see what, what are the evidences for Islam and what are the evidences for Christianity. Now I had told, I said I, I had read the, the Quran numerous times through. And this verse, for some reason, that I would read numerous times, jumped out at me. And it meant something different to me this time. It's, uh, I believe it's uh, in, in a Ma'idah. It's verse, uh, it's, it, which is the fifth surah, verse 45 to 47. The Quran says, let the people of the book, meaning the people of the gospel, Christians, judge by what God has revealed in it. Let the people of the book judge by what God has revealed in it. Now that word for revealed, what he has revealed is a present tense verb. Now, what this means really is that there is a book that the people of the book follow. And if that command in Muhammad's day in the seventh century was to be taken seriously, that means that book had to exist and it had to exist intact. It couldn't be a corrupt version because Allah would never guide people to a corrupt, ver corrupt book for guidance. So now I have a dilemma. I've got to find out, is this book really that we have today? The gospel that Christians claim is the gospel today. Is this the same? as the gospel that existed in Saudi Arabia in Muhammad's day. Because if it is, I have to make a tremendous decision to follow this book now. Because the verse, the verse later in the Quran says that those who do not follow God's commands and his word are transgressors. And I didn't want to be a transgressor. I wanted to follow God's commands in his book. I began to look into some of the um, evidences for the transmission of the gospel as we have it today, of the Bible, and see what existed in Saudi Arabia at the time that Muhammad spoke these words um, <clears throat> and the Quran said these things, what was the evidence to show that it, it, it lasted or didn't last from, those, from that time on to now? 
and you know, from looking through the Dead Sea Scrolls, from examining the textual critical arguments of uh, the great German scholars who had always put down the Bible as being unreliable, and seeing that there's actually great evidence to show that the Bible that was uh, around in Muhammad's day is the same Bible we have today. In fact, the evidence is even better than that. Actually, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and the New Testament for sure, existed as we have it today, hundreds of years before the Quran uh, uh, was revealed to the Arabs in Saudi Arabia. Well, one day, my uh, good friend of mine who had become a Christian, he invited me to go to church. I've never been to church before, and I was at a state where I was kind of open to it. That morning, I was waiting for them to come pick me up, my friends. And uh, as is probably already obvious, I'm not the kind of guy who is very silent. I talk a lot, and uh, I can't control myself sometimes. But this morning, I was uncharacteristically silent. I was just somber. And I go to this church service, and I sit there, and my friends are asking me, what's wrong? What's the matter with you? Because they know, Abdul's not talking. Something must be wrong. Well, I didn't say, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, I sat in the service, and I had this experience that's common, uh, I understand, among Christians and uh, even Muslims when they go to services, that the person speaking is speaking just to you. No one else is, in the, is there in the audience. Now, this was a, probably a 2,000-seat church, and I was wondering, did he know I was coming, this pastor? He doesn't know me. Well, he was speaking about how God has been knocking at the door your whole life, and he won't force himself in. Jesus won't force himself into your life, but he'll lean against the door. And if you don't lean back, he'll flood your life. And he asked a question at the end of the service. Has God been knocking on your door? Has he been leaning on your door? And have you been leaning back? Are you getting tired of leaning? Maybe it's time to stop. And I got really irritated that I didn't want to hear that, because it was too true. It was too close. And I left that service very upset. And I begin to hunch over, and I'm not given to emotional outbursts at all. It's not me. And for the first time I can ever remember, I openly sobbed in the parking lot. And I said out loud, I can't do it. It's too heavy. I can't hold it up anymore. And I assumed it was this burden of trying to wed Islam and Christianity so that I can, I can be comfortable in um, being on the fence. But it really was, I think was Jesus leading on the door, and I couldn't resist him any longer. I was trying too hard. So I decided to undertake to make it my job to study the scriptures, to study the evidence fully. And I did that over a course of months. And I can recall a time when I was sitting in my parents' den in their home, and I had, quite literally, all the evidence for Islam stacked up on one side of the, the desk. And my articles on Islam were shoved in the books from Islamic scholars. My notes were written on things. I had on this side of the desk all the books on Christianity and the resurrection of Jesus, which was I found to be the single point where I had to find out historically, one's right, one's wrong on this. Either he raised from the dead or he didn't. And I had all this evidence swirling around me, and I was wondering, why is it I find this evidence for the resurrection so compelling? It's so um, convincing. Why won't I accept it? Why won't I accept it? What's wrong with my heart? What's wrong with my mind? What's wrong with this evidence? And then the, ev the answer walked by the door. My father walked by. And he looked at me and he smiled because he was so proud because I was studying. And he was approving. He knew, he thought I was studying to be a better Muslim and a better um, emissary for Islam. And I realized that's what it was. I couldn't break his heart. And that's why I kept away from the evidence, kept away from Jesus so long because I couldn't break his heart and harm my mother or my brothers or the rest of my family. I couldn't do it. And I realized that I knew at that moment what truth cost would cost me, but I didn't know what it was worth. And this was truth. He did raise from the dead. But what did that mean for me? I didn't know that. And over the months, the Holy Spirit really worked on me to see this is not just a fact of history that I rose from the dead, meaning Jesus, of course, but that I rose from the dead is a fact of history, and that means that you, too, can have life. My crucifixion meant that you can have forgiveness for your sins because I paid the price, but because I live, 
And the Bible says, you also shall live. Well, since becoming a Christian, what's really changed my life has been my, my view of God. Before God was, I believed He was Almighty, I believed He was holy and all good, but there was no relationship, there was no intimacy there. And everyone longs for that sense of intimacy, that, 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 that bit of them that says, I know you know me, but I want to know you, Lord, I want to know you. I began to have a relationship closer to Him than ever before. As I encountered Him in prayer, it wasn't ritualistic, it wasn't just a formulaic way in which to pray. Um, it was more intimate, like talking to someone who I certainly revered as God and as holy and, um, and that kind of thing, but also someone who I could talk to and open up about anything to and felt real response. Not a voice, not an auditory voice, but I felt that because He would come to this earth and take on my sin and pay for my penalty, that I could give Him anything and I could have a reception back of what I had spoken to him. I felt that now. I never felt that before, but I now had this hope that God, and this knowledge, quite frankly, that God would not only just guide, but he'd be there with me. And he, and he, he comforted me by saying that my son suffered, and I suffered so much. I would, why would I not walk with you? And I felt that was a wonderful part of, and still is a wonderful part, of how I live this life. But all of that, all of my outlook on life is colored by now the knowledge that because He lives, I also shall live. That come what may, I have a hope that isn't just maybe if I'm good enough, I'll get in. But because He is so good, I will get in. That's why a Muslim should consider it. They should, even, they should look into it. Because if there's good reason to become a Christian, then what more can you ask for than the assurance of eternal life? Born as the firstborn to a Muslim family. My dad is the Imam of the mosque. And I have studied to become a Muslim evangelist. That was kind of a free study that I did in my life after I got my degree. Um, in our tradition, we were kind of a conservative Muslim family. Uh, during the month of Ramadan, as all Muslims know, that we tend to uh, what we say, khitm al-Qur'an. It means that recite the whole Qur'an during the month of Ramadan. But uh, we used to do it differently. We used to do it, my father and I, we used to do it five times. That's how I got to recite the Qur'an and uh, be one of the reciters by the age of 12. I have recited most of the hadith, the Sahih Bukhari, and some of Sahih Muslim, and Sunan Abu Dawood, and Sunan Ibn Majah. Uh, I started uh, Masnad Ahmed, but at this time I kind of uh, got to uh, join the military service. Uh, my life as a Muslim was a devout Muslim, believed in one God and Muhammad as his messenger, the last and the most honorable of the messengers. And I believe that the people of the book, which is Jews and Christians, are people that are went astray and they did not believe what God has sent them in the last revelation. Uh, I used to tell them that you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, but you never believed in the last testament, which is the Quran. And I used to argue with them that where did Jesus come from? In the Quran it says that Jesus is not God and he is going away with this and he said in, in Surah Al-Ma'idah he said he has nothing to do with this he said no Subhanaka Lam aqul illa ma'allamtani falamma tawafaytani kunta antum ala kunta ayat alayhum raqib al-hasib this is what I knew about Jesus Christ he has nothing to do with what the Christians claim and I spent most of my life believing this and I was evangelizing Muslim uh, Christians to bring them to Islam, to tell, to get them to the truth. And sometimes I was part of a group like Takfir and uh, Hijra. I was a, in a, a Muslim Brotherhood. I was very active in promoting the faith of Islam all over the country that I was born in. And uh, my goal was, and my dream was to die as a martyr for Allah. Uh, during a trip of mine outside my country, I uh, was 
kind of walking around and some people came and asked me for direction and when I gave them the direction they noticed from my accent where I'm from we kind of tend to have a big accent and uh, they started to talk to me in Arabic and I answered them back and they asked me what's your name I told them my name is Ahmed and they invited me for lunch to, and give me a ride where I'm going as well so I accepted and went with them and during the conversation it came up that I love reading which is true I love reading if, if you wanna if you wanna curse me out just write it on a paper and I'll read it so when I mentioned that one of them was a philosophy professor gave me a book and put his business card inside and the book name was mere Christianity written by C.S. Lewis uh, my English was not that good to uh, read such a book but I got a dictionary and I have few friends that uh, when I find a hard world that I, I cannot understand I call up and try to put it all in, in, in the contest and at this time when I realized how blasphemous the book is and how uh, idolatry in it that he puts many gods with gods and uh, all this stuff I just got mad at those people I was kind enough with you to show you the direction and I shared with you a lot I even offered to pay for lunch and everything and yet he gave me such a blasphemy book so I decided well it's a sign from Allah because I have forgot my duty I'm not here to play I should be telling them about the faith of Islam because it is written in the hadith that if one person comes to Islam through me it's better for me than the whole world and heavens combined together so what I'm waiting for so I decided to talk to them about Islam and bring them to the true faith all of them and they have daydreamed about the time that I'm gonna be with them and we're gonna burn their Bibles in celebration embracing Quran embracing Islam while I was talking to those people, I started to see how loving they are. I saw their love for no reason. They didn't ask anything of me. They just loved me for no reason. And I was so arrogant toward them. I was so bad toward them. I even lied to them. I was ruthless. I was as bad as you can say with them. But they were always facing me with a smile. They always presented what we call now the truth was love. And one of, the, one of the times I got into a fight with some of my friends and I promised to kill one of them, a Muslim friend. And I left. At this time I left with my only shirt and pants and it was 17 inches of snow. And I'm just walking in the street. And while I'm walking, a pickup st stops and a big guy inside of it tell me to hop in. I was freezing. So I jumped in the car and kind of fall asleep. By the time he tapped on my shoulder and said, this is your home. So I didn't think of it and I said, oh, thank you. And I tried to offer him money, but he said, no, it's between me and Jesus. So I told him, well, thank you. And I tried to turn around to open the door, but I forgot my coat and stuff where I was and I don't have the keys. And I didn't want to look stupid in front of him. So the guy looked at me and said, listen, Jesus loves you. And I deal, did with, with a mockery sound, I said, yeah, he loved him too. And uh, he told me, open, don't be afraid. And it hurt me to say that, this is my apartment, I paid for it, why would I be afraid? And I know from my security background when I say that this door is closed, it is closed. Almighty God himself cannot open it. And I wiggle with the knob and the door opens, I turn around to say, thank you to the guy there was no truck there was no tire prints there was no voice for this big truck or anything I went to the street just up the building and looked right, uh, right and left because we always have to start with right I looked like there is nothing the street was abandoned and I just remembered that this time I never told him where I live so I went inside my apartment, made sure that the door locked, and I just took a corner and sit in it, and I don't know what to do. And then I started to, it's time to pray. I need to have some time to reflect. So I went and washed up, and I put my prayer rug, faced Qibla, and wanted to start praying 
and I can't even recite Fatha. You know, Fatha is the surah, the first surah of the Quran, and that we have to recite with every raka'ah in, in the salah. And I can't even remember it. And I sat down and said, God, what's going on? I didn't hear anything. The second day I said, God, come on, I am tired. Please save me from my own self. And after a while, I found myself saying, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I heard my, myself saying that, so I, that, I did like that on my mouth. I couldn't finish it. And every time I tried to speak, I found myself saying, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I called up my friends and told them to come here. And believe me, if they were riding an ambulance, they wouldn't come faster. They came in, didn't knock on the door, they kicked the door in. And when I told them, your Lord is my Lord, your Savior is my Savior, they just start jumping, hugging me, and I'm not understanding what's going on. So I told them, okay, now enough with the hugging, tell me what's going on. So they explained to me from the very beginning how a man is sinful, how God had a plan for salvation, how his son had to shed his blood for my salvation, and they took me through the whole nine yard. And at this time, I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now I can put my head on the pillow and just go straight to sleep without thinking how much I'm gonna lie or try to remember the lies I did the other day so I can keep consistent. I don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I am not worrying about where I'm going to work, where I'm going to go. I'm just having peace. I am sleeping for the first time in my life. I used to wake up early in the morning to go and do Adan al-Fajr. That's about four o'clock in the morning to, to wake people up to do prayer. Now I can put my eyes and sleep. It's like somehow I am debt free and somehow I have a backbone somehow I have a father who is strong and mighty that I can run to him and ask of him and he's gonna protect me and take me in his in his arms and I will feel secure for the first time in my life and I started to feel love toward people if you were my enemy while I was a Muslim, if you are stronger than I, I will wait for you till you're turning around and I'm gonna hit you hard that you will never know what hit you. Now, if you are my enemy, I even love you more than my brother. I used to hate the Jews. I used to hate the Christians. Now I love all people. It doesn't matter what color, what race, what nationality, what religion. I just love you because I know that my God, my Savior, love you and died for you. My heart goes out to my Muslim people, especially my family. I know how good they are. I know how godly people they are. They love God. They worship God. They will do anything for God. But which God? They are deceived. They don't know the true God. Imagine that. How would they do to a loving God? that interact with them and take them as children instead of a deceiving, hard, far away God. You know, they are not bad people. They are very good people. They are more religious than us. Because when you look at it, they are doing what Allah is telling them to do. They are following the doctrine of Islam. They are following the teaching of their faith. And if they can do that, to such a faraway God, imagine what can they do for a true loving God. And it's our turn and our responsibility as ambassadors for Christ, as we have tasted the sweetness of the salvation, to show them the light, to show them the truthness and faithfulness of God and His love. And they will know that He, Jesus Christ, is the Lord and Savior. My father comes from the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. He was a Sunni Muslim. To this day, I still remember him singing his prayers. I remember him repeating his prayers. I remember as a young boy, four or five years old, going to the mosque. I remember when we did go to the mosque, I used to mimic my father and my grandfather in their prayers. When they got up, I got up. When they bowed down, I bowed down. 
on the holidays, on Eid and on Ramadan, our family used to celebrate them. A lot of food was made, relatives would come over. I remember asking my father why we had to sacrifice a sheep. And he would tell me it was a substitute for um, Abraham's son and that God required us to do that. There was never really a fear of God. There was also, there was always a, a respect for God. And uh, that's the way we were raised. I started seeing things um, the first time in a different light when I had a friend of mine that actually became a born again Christian. I saw his lifestyle before he received Christ as a Savior and after he received Christ as a Savior, and it was a big difference. And I, and I remember I walked up to him and I said, uh, hey, what's going on in your life? Why are you, aren't you doing the things you used to do? And he told me that he received Christ, but he didn't know too much about the scriptures or about uh, his faith that much, but I definitely saw there was a difference. Now, I was raised in a town where there was sometimes racial tension between whites and, and blacks. And I went to this Bible study and it was predominantly all black. And I remember going in there and I was a little um, intimidated. But I remember this black man came up to me and he told me that he loved me and he hugged me. That never happened to me before. I never had any man tell me that he loved me or give me a hug. I sat down and that's the first time I've ever heard the gospel or the gospel preached to me clear, clearly about who and what Jesus is and what he did. I sat down on the couch and a Bible was given to me. And they said, open up to Genesis. I was like, what is Genesis? I have no clue what Genesis is. And I remember this beautiful sister saw that I was struggling and she sat down next to me and she opened up her Bible and she showed me the scriptures of Genesis. And they were talking about Adam and Eve and how the first sacrifice in the Bible is when Adam and Eve committed a sin and God killed an animal and covered their nakedness with skins of, of that animal. Anyway, the point of the message was that God needed a sacrifice for our sins. The thought of the sacrifice just sparked my interest. And what really interests me the most was when I was there was I never saw true love before. I mean, these people really, truly loved God. And not only outwardly, but by their actions and what they did. And that intrigued me. I have never saw anybody go into really bad neighborhoods and try to help people. And again, they didn't only say it with their mouth, but they did it in their actions. And that, to me, was the biggest testimony. My second visit, I started to want to learn more about the Bible, where it came from, who wrote it. Uh, who is Jesus? How did he live his life? What were the apostles? Um, my, my interest was really sparked. These are things I never knew before. This is the first time I heard that God was love. My conception of God before that is that God was a wrathful God. And if I did anything wrong, he's going to send me to hell. I never knew that he was a God of forgiveness. I never knew that he was a God that loved me so much that he took my place on the cross and bore my sins, and because of him, I could have eternal life. Again, this was too good to believe, I, and, I, and I wanted to believe it, but it was too good to believe, and I felt that I had to do something to earn my salvation. But then I kept coming back to these Bible studies to learn more, to understand more. Maybe I went about five or six times ready. I remember being challenged, and I remember a brother coming up to me and he looked at me right in the eye and he said, are you ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight? I was scared. And I heard a lot about Jesus up until that point, but I wasn't ready to commit my life to him. And I had to make that decision. I, I, I couldn't walk the fence anymore. And it was a scary decision. And I felt that if I do make this decision, I'm gonna be rejected. I'm gonna compromise friendships. I'm going to compromise my, my uh, love for my family because I felt that I was abandoning my father and my grandfather. And, uh, you know, in my culture, you don't do that. You, you love your parents and, and you do whatever you can for them. You take care of them when they're older. You do everything the right way. But I, I had to make a decision. Am I going to honor my mother or my father to the point where I'm going to reject God's gift? But then I heard the pastor at the end of the Bible study give an invitation. And I said to myself, if I reject his message, I'm rejecting Jesus. I'm rejecting God. 
When I saw the testimonies of the people, how they conducted themselves, how they lived their lives, what the scripture said, and applying it, that ultimately made my decision that God is who He says He is. These people are genuine, and either they're telling me the truth or they're lying. It's got to be one or the other. And I believe they were telling me the truth. And I was so convicted that I cried because I understood the magnitude of who Jesus is. God revealed Himself to me in the Scriptures, and I received Him into my heart. He said, Lord, come into my life. You are who you say you are. And I made the ultimate decision that night. After I received Christ as my Savior, my whole viewpoint changed. It used to be selfishness, how I could get ahead in life, how can I make the most money in life. You know, I had a lot of uh, future uh, goals I wanted to achieve. But now after I received Christ as my Savior, those things weren't as important. Not that I neglect my duties as, uh, as a, a husband or a father or as a son or a brother or a friend, but my outlook on it completely changed. Now, when I do things, I want to do them unto the Lord, not in my own strength or capacity, but through His strength, through His capacity. And there has been many challenges in my life. You know, again, in my culture, we love our parents. We love our fathers, or our grandfathers, our mothers. I mean, we do everything we can for them. But um, when you do believe in Christ, especially coming from the background that I come from, you. I did face re rejection, and it's very hurtful. But I'm still there for my family, even though I was re rejected. And ultimately, ultimately, my family took me back, and they and they received me. So that was the hardest part: is becoming a Christian and having rejection from your family and friends. So, but ultimately, God can give you peace with that too. How I communicate with um, people that are from the Muslim faith and have that background, first of all, they're good, godly people. They really have a deep respect for the Lord. They're good people. They'll give you anything off their, uh, that they have. They'll share with you a piece of bread, the shirt off their back. I mean, I love Muslim people, and there's no two ways about that. But my biggest prayer and my sincere um, advice or whatever way you want to term it is that who is Messiah? Who is Isa? Look into the scriptures. Is he who he says he is? Is he a person that's just a prophet? Was it someone that took his place on that cross or did Isa actually die on the cross? If he actually died on the cross, then he is the Redeemer, the Savior, the Anointed One. That would be my question to ask. Is Jesus who he says he is? Is he the Jesus of the Bible? Or is he just a prophet? I believe he's much more than just a man. I believe that he is the anointed one, the prophesized one, the one that, that was spoken about since the beginning of time that was to come and to redeem the world. I believe he is going to come back again, and he will set up his, his, his kingdom. And I believe that through him we have eternal life. I would consider Jesus as my savior because all have fallen short. I knew that if I was to die tomorrow before I received Christ as my Savior and God sent me to hell, I deserved it. I wasn't going to argue with God. I knew I deserved hell. I knew I, I was never good enough. And God is a holy God. If anybody ever saw God, they would die. I understand that. That's why we need a Savior. We need one who is perfect. We need one who is that perfect sacrifice. And when I understood that Jesus Christ was that perfect sacrifice and that he willingly gave his life. That changed me. And that made me see things in a perspective I've never seen before. I think the world needs to know who Jesus is and truly consider it. Truly consider his death, his resurrection, that he defeated sin, death, and the devil on that cross. When you have that and you fully comprehend that, it's a freedom that surpasses all understanding. I remember for 20 years praying for my father and my grandfather. I loved them both dearly, and I would do anything for them. My father ultimately did pass away, but before he passed away, they had him on feeding tubes, they had him on respirators, they had him hooked up to a bed, and the only thing that was keeping him alive was machines. I remember when they pulled the plug, so to speak, that my father was going to pass away now. 
and um, they gave him a couple minutes to live because he couldn't breathe on his own. I remember looking at him and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, for 20 years I've been praying for this man. For 20 years I've been asking you to reveal truth, or if you really are who you say you are, to reveal truth to my father. I love him deeply, Lord. And they were going to pull the plug on him. And they did pull the plug. And I couldn't stand there and watch my father die. So I ran downstairs to the, they had a chapel and a hospital. And I remember getting on my knees and looking up to the Lord and saying, Lord, for 20 years I've been praying for this man. If you are real and you are who you say you are, don't let my father slip into eternity without knowing you as his Lord and Savior, as his Messiah. My sister-in-law comes running down into the chapel and gets me. She says, Roland, your father is breathing on his own. He came out of his coma. And whether it's politically correct or not, I didn't care. I remember a joy came over me. I grabbed the scriptures. I had a Bible in my hand and I ran up to my father and I shared the gospel with him about Christ and who he is and what he did on the cross. And I said, Pop, do you believe what I'm telling you? And he said, yes, I believe. And approximately a month later, my father passed away. But the joy that came, that knowing that God is faithful, is overwhelming. I grew up in the uh, Islamic uh, Muslim family. And uh, I remember when I was in high school, I went a lot to mosque. And uh, in the mosque, uh, I asked a lot of questions about who is God is. I, I really like to, I, I did like to be close to God. And um, I went uh, with some of friends there, and we had a small room uh, in the mosque. And we, can, we could stay and pray, talk, and uh, worship. Uh, but always I, had, uh, I was not happy uh, because um, I didn't know how, uh, when I am doing something, uh, I, can I please God? And always I, I thought I, I do something wrong, and uh, maybe he, he is not pleased. Uh, for example, when my father died in 12th grade when I was, um, for a long time I cried, what did I do wrong that my father died? And I was looking, maybe because I don't do very good for God, he punished me for that. I start to uh, think about Islam more, to find the reality of it. Uh, but every day um, I pray a lot more and more to um, get um, closer to God. And, but I, I, I was not happy. I was sitting in mall for learning English with the, the dictionary. And a lady came to me and um, say hi and um, we talked, um, hi and how are you? Then uh, she asked me, are you reading Bible? I didn't know what his Bible mean. I said, no, this is dictionary. And uh, she sit um, beside me and we start talking. You know, I didn't know a lot of English. And she, we um, used some words and some international words and talking and showing hand and with hand, with lips, with face. Then she started ask me a stupid question. And she said, oh, do you know Jesus? I said, I don't know him. And then she explained to me, Jesus is the prophet of my eyes. She said, Jesus, do you know Jesus is this, this, this? I said, oh, you are talking about Esau. Because I, we don't call him Jesus. It's the first time I heard his name, Jesus. And uh, then when we talked together, and same time her family came there. Uh, his son, her son, her daughter, her husband. And they came around me and they talked with me. And uh, we had a good time. Then they asked me to give them my telephone number, and I get their telephone number. Then they asked me to go to their home. I said, okay, for sure. I went to their home. And when I went to their home, they were very nice, very good. They didn't ask me what religion I have, who I am, where I am from. Just, just they were very nice. and. Uh, uh, they asked, um, I, I asked them, today come to my house? And they came. And we had um, started going and coming, and their children, and they came to my house, and I went to their home. And it was something different between them and others. I, I could see, for example, the first time I see they are holding hands and pray. And I saw they pray for me. 
And it was really sweet of them. It was so sweet and I enjoyed that. I saw them when they are going out, sometimes mm, the mother pray for their uh, younger one and for their children. I saw husband and wife pray and that is was not, they didn't know. I, I check all these things. So I say, what they are doing? And it was so amazing for me. No, they are not like other people. They are doing what they say. And um, I went to their home one day and asked them, what is different between you and other people? And they say, we are Christian. I say, so I am Muslim. Mm, what is make different between me and you? Uh, just because you are Christian, okay, I am Muslim, I am good. They say, no, mm, me, we are not good. The one uh, in us is good. And I didn't understand them. I said, please tell me what, what you mean. And they told me, uh, it's not religion. To is be rules and law is uh, all love for Christ because he did something good for us we want to be follow him we have a leader named Jesus Christ we follow him we do what he did not because what he say or what he wrote but what he did and because of that we want to be closer to him and um, I, I told them I want to m hear more and may you please mm, tell me more about it and the lady mm, uh, told me, I said, do you want to really know about it? I said, yes, I want to know about it. She said, okay, one minute. And she went up there and come back with a book in her hand. And the book was Bible. And she gave to me and said, because you asked, I gave to you. But I want to tell you that first night when I saw you and we, we talked together, I pray one day you ask me about this book and I did order this book to come. It's a long time in my room and I pray every day to you one day ask. And it was, I started crying because I saw how much she loved me as a person to be care about me. I read the book, it was so hard. I want to tell you, as a Muslim, I couldn't accept Christ can be God. That is the hardest thing. Everything I read New Testament, it was beautiful. Every teaching, it was good. But I couldn't accept Jesus Christ when he said, I am God. When I read the, mm, the book of John, I throw the Bible on the wall. I kick the Bible. I just get in mad. I say, look, you say all these good things. Why say you God? They just say, I am, I am Jesus. And I, you don't need to call yourself God. And um, I, I, I had a lot of problem with it. And um, every time I asked them, they said, look, he, he, he let him, he show himself to you. And I said, oh, now he wants to be dead. How he can sh show himself to me? I, I, I was very angry of this thing. They, they didn't tell me what is it. They said, read the book. And I read the book and read the book and read the book. Everything good, but that I couldn't accept his God. And we went to a um, camp uh, meeting. The preacher, when, when she, he started to speak, I, I thought he look at me. And he was just point on me, and because everything he was talking, it was my life. And uh, I thought mm, my friend told him about my life, and I was mad if I could find him, I beat him up because he was talking about the uh, the son left his family and left all, all the way, and what happened to him, and he get uh, the prodigal son, and um, I was really thought it, he's talking about me and uh, I start crying because I, I could see myself but when he started telling me telling me because I thought he's talking with me um, uh, that uh, the father was outside waiting for him it was a story the son gone and did all things bad and once come back home he scared Maybe his father doesn't accept him, but his father didn't ask anything and hug him and accept him. And uh, then he asked if somebody um, wants to go to the father and um, be in his home, confront. I was the first person to run to the front and sit and kneel down and start crying. And I remember I cannot stop because 
the joy every time I talk, that thing is coming to my heart. Because when I sit there, uh, I, I just want to be with God. I want to be my father and I want to Jesus hold me in his arm. And he came and prayed for me. I tell you, I don't know who, everybody of us maybe have different experience, but that thing I think most of us when we accept Christ is saying, it was the most joyful time in my life. It was like a fire coming from my head to my body. And take away all the things I thought is not true. Because I, I feel I know He's God. In the same times I know He's with me. And I didn't have any experience of that. But I tell you, if that times all made all the world that told me Jesus is not exist, I was believe He exists. Because I could see Him in my life. I could see in my heart. And the joy came to me is just is like uh, connect me with God. It just I, I see him. I, I found him. It's just all my life was waiting. It just came true. I read um, New Testament ten times before I accept Christ. But when I accept Christ, I could understand it more. And I arrived the first time after I um, accept Christ. I was reading Ephesians. And I arrived to that thing. He chose you before the foundation of the world. I thought about it and read it and suddenly I jumped and running around the house of joy because I just that time I understand he hold me in uh, his hand and take me a step by a step he brought me to mall and same times he was working to other lady to she come that day and that night to mall to we met and I know him. That is powerful. I said, he chose me before the foundation of the world and that scripture is true. I just, I tell you, I was running around the house and I didn't know what I can do because I knew that is living word and is meaning a lot for me, that scripture. Christ for me is everything. I, I don't know how I can live without him. And he's, he's real. It's not something you can't... I tell them, Christ, Jesus Christ is real. It's not a story. It's not because when you are getting with him, you can feel him every day, every step. I tell you, if all the world say, this is not God, I don't care. He is God. What reached me for Christ, what reached me for the gospel, it was one solitary high school boy who refused to take no for an answer. In the Western culture, in the Western civilization, Christians basically hit one shot and done. You tell somebody about Jesus, if they reject you, bye. You have to understand in our world, for a Muslim to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to leave Islam, you lose your culture, family, job, home, sometimes your life. The average Muslim, it takes seven years to come to faith in Jesus. For me, it was, it was any number of years. But one boy, from the moment he started talking to me, would not leave me alone. It didn't matter how many times I said no. I, 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 he invited me to events. He invited me to uh, special all-night things. He, he invited me to concerts. I said no, 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 no. I did not want contact with the uh, kafurim, with the infidel. Finally, my senior year in high school, to show him, I walked into this little church. So one solitary boy, one tiny little storefront church, one pastor who had maybe a sixth grade elementary school education. It was always the small, the isolated, the anonymous. And if you think about it, Christianity marches on the shoulders of anonymous people who have invested their lives. I mean, any person watching, if you do a, a, a detailed analysis of your life, most of the people who radically affected you were people who the world doesn't know their names. Their names aren't on the spines of books or on the sides of buildings. They're, they're the anonymous. And it was an anonymous boy. It was an anonymous church. It was an anonymous pastor. And it was one little people who loved me to the cross. 
and this is important because everything I had ever learned about Christianity, I had learned from my imam, from my uh, masjid, from my mosque, from my leadership, every single one of them. And, and, and every caricature that I held was based on caricatures that other people had held. The meaner I was to them, or the more sarcastic I was, or caustic I was, the nicer they were to me. I sat by myself, boom, they all come sit around me. Uh, I'm churlish, and they just smile. I was amazed at the ability of the Christian to love me in spite of me. And this is important because it's unconditional. And when I finally afterwards asked them, why are you so nice to him? Why were you so... Well, I said, that's the way Jesus loved us. Romans 5.8, for God commanded his love toward us that while we were still sinners, while we were still at war with him, while we still hated him, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. That is a, a radical concept for somebody like me. He takes me to the pastor. The young man does. And the pastor says, what do you think about Jesus? And I said, in Isa, his name is Isa in Islam. We respect Isa. As a matter of fact, we named the 19th uh, surah of the Quran after his mother, Surah Miriam. He said, you can't respect Jesus. It's something that I tell Muslims when they say, no, we hold him in high reverence and high respect. You cannot respect Jesus. Because Jesus declared himself to be God. Isa ab Messiah. Jesus said he was Messiah. And more than just Messiah to the Jew, but he came to die for the world. If Jesus said these things, he is not qualified to be a prophet in Islam. The people who claim to be God, and there's thousands of them throughout history that have claimed to be God, they are either diluted, or in the case of Jesus, he actually is who he says he is. But in either case, some man walking down the streets drinking alcohol who's talking to himself who thinks he's God does not deserve my respect. To summarize it, he said, you either revere him as God or reject him as a fraud, but you don't have the option of just respecting him. That door opened. He asked me this question. He said, Islam teaches that Jesus wasn't crucified. Yes, Surah 4, verse 157, Esau was not crucified, but somebody else in his place. He said, why would Jesus be indicted of a crime worthy of crucifixion to begin with? Was it trumped up charges? No. Was it blasphemy? Yes. What's blasphemy? In other words, he opened the door to me about crucifixion. That when Jesus died, his death had some meaning, some hope. In every debate that I've done, in every time I've debated Muslim, Sunni, Sufi, Alawit, uh, Shia, every debate I've ever done, this question always comes up from the Muslim. What does one man's death have to do with me? But you see, in Islam, there is a measure of this. If I die to further Islam, I am helping my children, I am helping um, my family, I'm helping future generations. So my death does, in fact, resonate throughout Islam. The question I ask them is, what would Jesus' death resonate for you? In other words, if Jesus shed his blood, I don't have to. Jesus' blood shed, Jesus' death offers me the one thing that Islam cannot answer, and that is the screaming need for my assurance, the screaming need for forgiveness. And so Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, dies on the cross, buried three days, resurrects, ascends into heaven's temple, presents his blood, and then he sits down. And so then I will ask the Muslim, why would, why would, Isa, why would Jesus sit down? Is he tired? And he sat down because he was done. Finished. Atonement has been offered. If I may say it this way, Jesus strapped himself to a cross so that I wouldn't have to strap a bomb to myself. I lasted four days in that church. After so many years of struggling, I lasted four days. On the fourth day, I came forward. Um, I told the pastor, Isa bin Allah, Jesus is the Son of God. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. Now, that's all preacher talk for simply saying that I wanted Jesus 
to forgive me of my sins. I accepted his sacrifice in my life. I accepted his bloodshed for me. I repented of my sin, turned my life over to him. He is not just a messenger. He is Messiah. And he's not just uh, the lover of my soul. He is now the Lord of my life. And in so doing, I learned that I live much more righteously when I'm not trying to earn his favor. I do so because I've already been receiving his favor. I do so because I love him like a child to his father. I do things to love him, not to earn his love. Up until the moment I became a Christian, everything I did was based on fear of the scales. Discovering that Jesus Christ forgiving me, cleansing me, saving me, had done this for me, I'm now confused. So do I not do good works? Often Muslims will point to hypocrites. And I, and I tell Christians, I say, you know, the worst Christian they know is the best Christian they understand because they always see the hypocrites. And I said, does that mean that I can go do what I want? That I can go live the way I want? Because now I don't have to earn his favor? And it's the exact opposite. I slowly had to learn that I do what I do, and I am what I am, and I read what I read, say what I say, not to be accepted, but because I am accepted. This change in my life, diet, this change of life, I pray more now than I did before I was a Muslim, when I was a Muslim, because I don't have to pray. God tells me I have access to the throne at any moment. Uh, it was said of, of one evangelist that he was not long without prayer, but not long in prayer. I don't have to go on for hours to prove something. I pray when I have a need. I pray that moment. I pray that second. I don't have to do wudu. I don't have to do cleansing. I don't have to put myself in a certain position or else he won't hear me. He hears. He loves. And because God is so intimate, the call for me to live a right life is now the love that a child has for his father. I want his acceptance. I know I have his love. Let me, let me if I may add one little point here. What is interesting is the liberation for so many Muslims who come to faith in Jesus, leave Islam, become a Christian, is that we don't know how to respond to unconditional love that way. We cry easily. We are so free to love him back. One of the things that, that catches my attention in Christianity is the idea of loving God unconditionally and without fear. Um, they call it worship. It's devotion. It's, it's passionate. It's driven. This is foreign concept to us. Because when we speak of Allah, in every debate, in every discussion, I have never met one Muslim, not one, who believes that the Allah of the Quran and Jehovah intimate Adonai God of the Bible are the same God. Allah is not Father. The Quran, Surah 112, the most important chapter of Quran, says that Allah does not beget nor is He begotten. Allah does not have children. Uh, to use the big terminology that people use, Allah is transcendent. That is, He is judge, He's creator, He's on the throne, He's watching, He's separate. But Christianity teaches more than just that. The Bible presents that Jesus God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are not just judge and creator, but intimate, indwelling. There is no such thing for a Muslim to have a personal, intimate, uh, indwelt relationship with Allah. I found out that when I got saved, that we come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in a time of need. No, you're not. The Bible says that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit indwells you that I am inhabited by God, in that He comes and lives in my life. This is profound to someone who has never heard this. We did things in Islam for the first almost 20 years of my life. We did things out of fear, out of obedience. Uh, when you pray, you pray because Allah will do what Allah will do, but you ask out of obedience. As a Christian, I ask because he is Father. 
It's one of those degrees of separation that separate Christianity from any other world religion. We're not religious, we're saved. But that's more than just a little bumper sticker. Christianity offers a relationship with the Creator as Father. No other world system has an intimacy with Creator as, as the Father and Child intimacy. In Christianity, and only in Christianity, does God offer the sacrifice for man. Around the world, people throw virgins in volcanoes. We, we sacrifice blood on rocks uh, because we are trying to appease the wrath of God. But Jesus on the cross took the wrath of God against sin. As I referenced, the most difficult thing to understand as a Muslim is the concept of the atonement. Why would Jesus die for me? But the twin difficulty is the issue of grace. Because that's the answer to the question of why. I love the fact that in my world and in my culture we ask questions. We want to know the reason. I love the fact that we are passionate and we debate. That we want to know answers. We won't accept rote, uh, silly little euphemisms that we use. But they ask, why would Jesus die? Answer. Because grace compels him. And I define to Muslims this way. Mercy and grace are twins. The Quran says Allah is merciful, the beneficent. But in Islam, mercy simply means that he does not kill you when he can. It is a sign of his sovereignty. In Christianity it's different, and in the Bible it's different. Mercy is when I, when I don't receive what I should get. But grace is when I receive that which I don't deserve. Mercy, I don't get what I do deserve. Grace, I receive that which I don't deserve. Which means grace, God does for me, even though I have done nothing to merit it, nothing to earn it. Christ died for me while I still didn't want it. And if Christ's death is in that measure, that's grace, and that's unconditional. I always challenge the Muslim. You say that Allah is love. Show me one verse in the Quran. Show me one where Allah loves those who hate him. Allah loves unconditionally. The Quran is full of times where it says that Allah loves those who repent, Allah loves those who forgive, Allah loves those who act right. But show me where Allah loves those who don't want that love. That's the definition of unconditional love. It's the love of a father for his children. It's Christ dying for us. It's the godly for the ungodly. It's the just for the unjust. The promise is the cross was unfair. But it was still just. It was just because God's wrath does have to be appeased. And the Muslim is right. God's anger towards sin. But if Jesus dies, and Jesus dies in our stead, then it, it, the crucifixion was just because it paid the payment. But it was mercy because he didn't owe the debt. It wasn't his bill to pay. And it was grace because then he offers that forgiveness to me, unconditionally. Often I will hear a Muslim say, well, I, I, have to, I have to think of this, I have to get better before I'm ready for this. No, that's like taking a bath before a shower. The cleansing that takes place in my life is done to me, just like his death was done for me. If I may use the words, salvation was done for me, sanctification is done for me. Jesus buying my sin and Jesus making me good. It's done to me. It's done for me. It is done so that I now do differently, act differently, but I do so because I love him. I ask the fathers in Islam all the time, do you want your children to obey or to love you? And they think about it. Well, they must obey. Well, why do they obey? Because they love me. Do you want them to fear you or love you? I don't want them to fear me if that means that they're scared that I will always hit them. Because, you know, what's universal is the love for children. Well, tell me, does Islam offer a love of Allah and obedience because you love Him? That's all Christianity is. Legalism and Christianity do not walk hand in hand. Holiness does. I define it this way. I do now what I do because I love Him. I don't do it because I'm trying to be a legalist. A person who loves God and tries to walk in holiness does so because we want to look more like Jesus. A legalist always wants you to look more like them. 
They define whatever Christianity means by whatever they are. I just want to be more like him. Will I ever achieve it? Absolutely not. Does that mean that the journey is uh, negated? Of course not. It, it means that I do what I do because God isn't looking for my perfection. He just wants to see that I'm in the right uh, direction, that I'm going in the right path. Not that I'm doing it to earn his favor. The straight path was a crooked cross. And, and I tell my Muslims, those that even may hate me, that I can't hate them anymore. Jesus said the measure of Christianity is a love for those who hate us. The Muslim is not the enemy. He is the one for whom Christ died. It's my job to love you even if you don't love me. It's hard, but it is exactly what Jesus did for us. One of the major objections that Muslim apologists, that Muslim philosophers and scholars will present was the Trinity. They cannot possibly fathom how God can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same moment. Who is Jesus talking to? Himself? Does that make him schizophrenic? And I always use very natural, simple illustrations. There's nothing that we can find that absolutely dictates truth on the Trinity. We know that the Bible teaches the Trinity. We know God is triune. But how do we in our limited, finite minds understand uh, the infinite? But I do use simple things that draw us to it. I will usually pause and say, why does that cause you any trouble? Space is a Trinity. And remember, in our world, space is something that's very important. And I will point to some point in the air, and I will say, you see this point at the end of my fingernail? That is depth and height and width simultaneously. Why does that cause you a problem? I will point to my watch, and I will say, time is trinity. This moment that we're talking is both past, present, and future simultaneously. Why does that cause you a problem? Because I cannot understand it in the physical sense. I just explained two physical things. Yes, but this is a trick. It's not a trick. It's three dimensions. Now, am I saying God's three-dimensional? I'm saying that God is infinitely greater than our illustrations. But it isn't hard to fathom it if you understand that there's so many other analogies that seem to point us to the fact the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one substance, three persons, triune, because if he's not, then the Bible's wrong. Because if the Bible's wrong, it references God the Father as God, God the Son as God, and God the Spirit as God. If that's wrong, the rest of it's made up too. They will ask, well, who, who then was Jesus talking to? I said, to the Father. But he said he did not come to do his will, but the Father's will. I said, while he was on the earth, yes. Well, he said he did not know when he would return in the Bible. That's right. He knows now. Well, then why on earth did he not know? Because when Jesus was on the earth, he didn't lay aside his God part. He laid aside his divine prerogatives. Jesus walked from Jerusalem to Jericho. Could he have blinked his eyes and flown? Of course. Could he have walked through walls? Of course. Could he have just transcended time and space? And, and Of course. He chose by his divine will to walk. Why? his identity with humanity. And part of his identity with humanity as a perfect human, as well as perfect God, was that he chose to self-limit his divine prerogatives. There were times where it leaked out, like the Mount of Transfiguration. But he chose, while on earth, to lay aside his divine will, and thus he becomes the work of the Father. Who is Jesus talking to? Well, even in the Quran, Surah 3 teaches that Jesus spoke from the cradle, that he said, I am a messenger of Allah. The Quran teaches the virgin birth, the pure birth. The Quran teaches that Jesus formed a clay bird. The Quran teaches that Jesus spoke as an infant, as a newborn. The Quran teaches that Jesus did many clear signs. Who did that for him? Well, they will say Allah. Why? Well, because he is a messenger. Why? Because Allah will do what he wants. There you go. If God is God, he's beyond anything you can ask. 
it brings us to the point of understanding that even in Islam, though they believe they are so rational, there are things that they don't have answers to. That doesn't mean they don't believe him. I'm simply showing that the Trinity is, is rational, cogent, understandable, but it's infinite. The liberation that comes from salvation is the freedom of knowing that I fear God out of reverence, out of love, but I am free from judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, that he loves me warts and all. The fear of being perfect when you first get married, you're afraid your wife will see what you look like when you wake up. You fear that she's going to see that you don't always smile when you're supposed to. You're going to fear that she's going to see a glimpse of your anger. And then she sees those things. And you're amazed that she doesn't leave. God loves me, and he already knows those things. God loves us. He already knows all of our faults. God loves you, and he already knows your doubt, your fear, your angst, your terror. And yet he still loves you. The only thing that could compel that is the heart of God. For my Christian friends, I pray for their patience. We have a tendency to give up too quickly. I have been waiting now for 24 years for the salvation of the rest of my family. I can't stop praying. When I pray for them, I wish I could pray, Lord, save them and, and you know, do it against their will, but he, he doesn't work that way. So what I pray is for God to put people in their path where they, the person will not only tell them the gospel, but be aware of the opportunity to share mercy and grace, the atonement and salvation, in, in such a way that it's understandable. A lot of us hide behind big words. I mean, it's the world I live in as a theologian or as a, as a scholar. I don't, I don't like using those words because I would much rather be understandable than to be uh, highly honored. So I pray that God puts people in their lives that will tell them the gospel so clearly that they understand the relief that comes from not having to live by scales. Instead of living by the scales, I live by the cross. Both look like a balance. But in this way, I have to do on the cross, on the cross he did for you.